Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the steering committee of our World Heritage, uh, Diversities and Gender Theme, I, I would like to uh, thank all of you uh, to coming here today. Uh, our World Heritage Initiative is founded uh, to open up heritage uh, management and conservation um, to the civil society uh, more and more. And uh, through the to, through the 2021 uh, debates, uh, we would like to discuss, uh, rethink, reconsider uh, the World Heritage Convention at its um, its 50th anniversary, and uh, diversities and gender theme uh, is for the theme for uh, March. Uh, through these debates, uh, we would like to open four webinars uh, in each week of the March and a two-day conference on 29th and 30th of March and call for action uh, for new narratives in heritage. So uh, within these debates we would like to uh, discuss exclusionary process uh, at World Heritage sites uh, at play and uh, with the recommendations and with the proposal uh, through these debates, we would like to enhance uh, World Her Heritage Convention uh, at its 50th uh, anniversary. So, uh, the topic of today is uh, marginalization and minorization, uh, domination, discrimination, exclusion, er and erasure uh, in World Heritage sites. Uh, here we would like to address how heritage could be a tool itself as undermining social inclusion and diversity. And we would like to argue how some policies and practices and mechanisms uh, cause to erase particular histories for certain groups and societies. And we would like to also highlight today uh, how innovative approaches in world heritage sites also could be developed in order to uh, reclaim heritage. Uh, in order to have a lively debate today, uh, we invite uh, speakers from different geographies with different stories and uh, within the intersection of marginalization, minorization and world heritage. So uh, our first speaker uh, will be from New Zealand to a short, to a short land. Uh, she is, belongs to indigenous community of New Zealand, the Maori, and she uh, deals with sustainable research management, environment policy, indigenous rights, knowledge and innovation. And our uh, second speaker will be from a social enterprise uh, from Palermo, Claudio Restivo, and uh, he will give us uh, a speech about multi their uh, social enterprise in Palermo Cultural uh, Historic Urban Center. And our third speaker from Australia, Kelly Pollard. Uh, Kelly Pollard is a Viratjuri researcher and a lecturer uh, in Charles Darwin University of Australia. And he also, sorry, she also uh, researches on indigenous uh, epistemologies, ontologies, and uh, axiologies. And our first speaker uh, will be from Turkey, the Arbakar Vault City. Uh, Dijle Beştaş will be speak will speak uh, on behalf of Loading Art Space uh, in the Arbakar to give a brief uh, info about what happened in the Arbakar Vault City and how it can link to our uh, discussions today. So uh, I welcome you all, and we will start with. To it to the, to it today, and then um, I'm giving more detailed information about her. And she belongs to the indigenous community of New Zealand, the Maori, and uh, she contributes to sustainable research management, environment policy, and the uh, upholding indigenous rights, knowledge, and innovation. And she is also founder of. Awetea Organics, which specialize in uh, cultivating indigenous food sovereignty from her ancestral lands, where she managed uh, the family farm to reconnect people uh, to lands. Uh, at this initiative, uh, they mentor new farmers using the, not only to produce nutritious uh, heritage food 
and medicine, but also as a training ground for workshops and community uh, open days and uh, developing and prom promoting innovations in uh, indigenous organic food, medicine and plant production and impro to improve uh, biodiversity. Uh, she is also actively involving in uh, indigenous uh, diplomacy with the uh, United Nations. And uh, Tui, uh, the screen is yours. You're welcome. Come everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the hosts today for uh, this webinar and uh, it's very, I uh, feel very fortunate to be all the way down here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, sharing with you our uh, journey of reclaiming our heritage. And I really look forward to listening to everybody else's uh, presentations as well and the questions and answers. Um, this is our, our land here. I'll just start the slideshow. Uh, you're, what you're looking at now is, is an, a, a, an overview of the, our family land here, which is north of Auckland, and uh, the, the family land is called Te Rewerewa, uh, and that's where, where I am dialing in from today. Uh, so this is the harbour view when you're up on, on the land. We're sitting on Whangarei Harbour. We have the harbour on one side of us, and we have a river on the inside of us, but we also have the uh, Whangarei city, just uh, the central business district right on our doorstep. And this is an aerial view of uh, our land. It's a 165 uh, hectare land block. It's the last existing Māori land block in the city. There are very few uh, ancestral lands left in the country. This is an example of the land alienation. Sorry, I'll just put that. Uh, since the 1860s, so when the Native Land Court was established, soon after uh, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, uh, the land became uh, illegally uh, taken and so we have very small patch left here which we feel very humbled to have. Uh, over the years around uh, the 1850s the confiscations began for the establishment of Whangarei City. The, uh, a railway was put in between us and uh, our ocean so we can no longer access our marine resources. And uh, the land was confiscated and uh, made into the smaller block that it is now. Uh, the people were pushed off. Pine was uh, raised on the land, which was only just harvested around eight years ago, and no one came back. And so our project is the first project to be back on the land. We've been here three years. When we came onto the land, this is what we had left. Uh, all noxious weeds, very little uh, natives left on the land. But that, you know, as Indigenous people, that's what we want to do. We want to reclaim our culture and we want to do that by restoring our cultural landscape. So uh, we started to unearth all of the uh, noxious weeds and things like that and began to grow our, our family cultivation. So the main purpose of these was to reconnect people to the land, uh, to provide healthy food to our people, and to explore the commercial opportunities to grow right in Whangarei City. We believe that our people can live uh, similarly as we did in peace, uh, enjoying our heritage food and our heritage medicine, uh, whilst also supporting our needs uh, to house ourselves and live comfortably. Uh, these are some of our heritage foods. So, so uh, some of you may know that in, in the areas of food sovereignty and access to food and food justice, uh, well, in our case, anyway, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have a seed famine. So we can't access a lot of the uh, um, heritage potatoes that we love. And uh, we really feel like it's an injustice if there's a, a Maori person, an Indigenous person that is craving to eat uh, their traditional 
first, like the come come on, wash or the tuddle, there is an injustice if they can't have that for dinner. And not, not many can uh, these days. So what we, we set about three years ago to focus on our heritage food. And uh, these are the ones that we cultivate uh, under Rungu Matane. So he is our God of cultivating food and our God of peace as well. Uh, you know, all of the things that we do have the underlying spiritual dimension uh, to, to what we do as well. And then the wild foods as well. So we've begun to restore the forests and restore the waterways here. Um, council, the local council also buried our streams uh, over the time that the land was alienated and the people were pushed off. And so we were also trying to recover those streams as well. And a lot of that is around planting native, um, native food forests again and having our protein trees and our um, medicinal trees and things like that. And what we've done in the short period that we've been here is that we've increased biodiversity. We've increased the bird life. We have beehives here. We really love our pollinators. We recognize that native moss pollinate you know, the plants that uh, flower at night, you know, we're really relearning a lot of, around um, our wildlife and understanding that our pollinators, you know, around the world are endangered and we really need to uh, look after them and live in harmony with them. And so I talked about sustaining livelihoods. We mentor young farmers on a weekly basis here. Uh, we are part of uh, farmers collectives where we support them to access the market. Uh, and the organic market here, and particularly since COVID, the uh, demand for good organic indigenous growing produce and seed has been really phenomenal. And now we are uh, supplying over 30 varieties of organic seed all around the country and uh, some seed also to Australia, <laughs> where there are the Maori that like this type of food. And so we've quickly become one of the biggest indigenous suppliers of seed uh, in the country, which we, we're really quite happy about since we love our seed. Um, we believe in, I'll just rush through this because I know that time is short, but I wanted to make the correlation that, you know, Indigenous people, 370 million in the world, we're living in 90 different countries, recovering of the land area, 32% of the world, and we all hold by Father Earth Mother as sacred. You know, and I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, it's well, quite well known these days that we find Indigenous people looking after those food stories, we also find the greatest amount of biodiversity on the planet. And these are some of the tools that we produce, um, you know, because we're mentoring farmers as well, and we're teaching people about how you can look to the environment to tell you what is happening with the climate and um, what your coming harvest to how you can prepare for that. So we do these tools as well, how you look to the stars often to understand what your harvest in six months will be. And this is the last slide. So we have, uh, we develop also the cultural indicators uh, frameworks. So in terms of what I just talked about, how the environment changes and from that, it, using our traditional knowledge and practices, we can understand, you know, what we are going to expect in the seasons to come. And so we felt that that would be a really uh, useful framework to begin to put it together so other communities could assess their forest house or uh, their land blocks as well and restore uh, their heritage in the landscape. So uh, there's a long list there and I won't go through it, but I thought I'd just give you an example of some of the other, you know, we're on farm here planting, but we're also like making tools and um, promoting uh, different new policies Anawatu Y is now the new framework here where rivers are beginning to get um, legal personhood, you know, and um, what does that mean for local councils who have 
buried our rivers and stopped our water security and things like that. And I think, you know, we're in, in this moment of emancipation where everyone is looking for uh, ways that we can uh, reclaim, reclaim the peaceful lives that we have. So thank you very much uh, for listening to my presentation and I look forward to listening to everybody else. Uh, thank you very much, Tui. It was a very interesting contribution to our webinar today. Uh, now, we, now we will move to uh, Claudio Aristivo from Multivolta um, Social Enterprise, which is based in Valparo neighborhood in Palermo Neighborhood Center, uh, where 14 different immigrant communities uh, live. Uh, this project of Multivalti uh, intimately connected with the neighborhood uh, that grows in equilibrium uh, with the colorfully populated market from old and new citizens. Uh, this project started in 2014 uh, thanks to the idea of multicultural team of 14 persons coming from four, uh, eight different countries. Uh, today, uh, 28 persons mm -hmm. from 10 countries work here. Uh, and Multivolti also is uh, composed of a restaurant with uh, ethnic and uh, popular cuisine and a very free uh, co-working space for 12 different non-profit organizations that every day organize activities uh, with migrants, minors and disadvantaged categories. And Claudia is a founder of Multivolti, one of the founders of Multivolti and uh, he's here today with us in the very early morning. Uh, thank you, Claudia, and uh, the screen is yours. Thanks to you. Hi, everyone. I hope you hear me well. Um, uh, I'm one of the co-founder co of Multivolti, that is a, is a social enterprise. And um, that means, uh, okay, Multivolti means uh, many faces, because we started from the idea that in a period when the discussion on migration system was very, uh, very strong. Uh, we, we didn't like so much the discussion about numbers, but we preferred to speak about people. So the face, the stories of each person uh, in uh, the direction to go um, over the, the idea of marginalization or, uh, uh, I mean, the, um, to go in, in, the, in the direction of a, uh, mathematic uh, uh, affair. So uh, starting from that, we, we uh, decided to uh, create our project in Palermo and especially in Ballarò, that is a, uh, a multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural area of the city where 14 different uh, uh, cultures live together. And uh, uh, if I, I can try to share, I will try to share my screen. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, this first photo is, is the is the photo of the of a part of the group of the founder of the of the project uh, that, uh, as was said before, is uh, composed by uh, fourteen person was composed by uh, fourteen person coming from eight different countries. Many uh, of the people we involved in the first period were refugees or asylum seekers. And we started from the idea that uh, um, create a job opportunity, a good job opportunity, uh, was the uh, one of the best uh, idea uh, to go out from uh, uh, marginalization or from exclusion process. So we started in 40, now we are 28 person, uh, as I said, we uh, coming from from uh, African or Asian countries and uh, through
So uh, in, uh, with this uh, phenomenon, I mean, migrants arriving in, uh, in a lack of job and uh, unemployment, uh, a system of uh, exclusion is uh, very uh, easy uh, to arrive. So we decide to create uh, uh, our proposal um, in uh, putting together four, uh, four aspects of our uh, life. I mean, uh, we put together people with a, a professional background uh, coming from social activities. Uh, we put people coming from uh, uh, with uh, background coming from uh, uh, I mean, the, the restaurant and so on, uh, from tourism and, uh, and, and so on. So we did, uh, we put all together in a, in a whole uh, space, in a, uh, in, in a unique space that is multivolti. And uh, uh, we tried to make uh, our proposal to create uh, job opportunities to go out from the invisibility. Uh, because what we say always is that, uh, is that, uh, we don't like to make uh, uh, a comparison uh, between uh, uh, Italian and non-Italian people when we speak about uh, uh, discrimination or mar marginalization or exclusion. Uh, but we know that an Italian uh, person, an Italian poor person is an Italian, is, an, is a poor person. Um, uh, an African uh, poor person in Italy is someone that also uh, lose his document, so became invisible. I mean, uh, a native cannot lose his document. And this distinction is, is very important to understand what can happen af uh, after that. So we decided to open the restaurant be because inside the restaurant, uh, we had the opportunity to start from the uh, competency, the knowledge of everyone especially from refugees that came in our place, because we know that everyone has a link uh, with, uh, starting from his culture uh, with food. And food is a good way to express uh, your culture, your, uh, um, yeah, your culture, but also to create your uh, job opportunity and, and to uh, create your new identity. So we did. We we made a Sicilian ethnic restaurant uh, because we consider Sicily as a uh, as a place uh, full of contamination uh, of uh, cultures that find in the, in the food the perfect um, idea of uh, of this contamination. So in uh, inside our restaurant in this moment uh, we have five uh, chefs from five different countries. Uh, three of them are, refu are uh, refugees and, and two were asylum seekers. And uh, thanks to the, this uh, job, uh, they create their new identity, their new inclusion in the society. Okay, this is one of our chefs, that is uh, Shabur. He was a, a, um, a soldier in Afghanistan and he escaped from there and now is the, the main chef of the, our place. Uh, together with the restaurant where now works 28 person, as I say, um, we create a co-working space because we say if the restaurant is the commercial, the, uh, the commercial and the profit part of our project where people can find its job, uh, the co-working is the, um, the permanent work workshop where we can give for free a uh, desk and space for people and for especially for organization involved in the migrants issues so uh, uh, we host for free 12 organization that every day works in the space uh, in the topic of the human rights protection um, they support uh, migrants to make their documents the paper and so on so the co-working space is in the non-profit area where is the thinking area of the place that is supported economically from the restaurant. So uh, the, the co-working uh, create the identity of the place, the social identity of the place, and the restaurant provide for the economic resource. Responsible tourism is the other part uh, of our project that start from the idea to change the point of view 
uh, with, uh, of, um, when we speak about migrants in our local context. Because we always think, uh, uh, when we speak about some of them, about, uh, we always think about uh, someone to help. So starting from this idea, we try to change the point of view and we ask two migrants living in Palermo to organize a, a trip in their original country. Um, so, for example, uh, we do very often with a, a friend from Senegal, we do uh, this kind of uh, trip with him, with organized group, and he became the tourist guide in, uh, in his uh, country. And through his, uh, his, very, his, his, uh, his, his places. So we, it's not the classic tourist uh, uh, tour. Uh, that you, you go in the hotel and so on, but you go in the houses of his family and friends and so on. So in that uh, way, you have a trip, you have a holiday, but you change totally the point of view of the, from, uh, with, the, uh, with the migrant because, because he became from someone to save or to help to someone that is your uh, uh, your first um, I mean is your is the the most important person you have there. Uh, so uh, we do every every year three or four trip in mainly in African countries, uh, starting from the story of the person. So it's not so important. Uh, tradition. So we start from that to organize a lot of uh, initiative to renovate uh, the space, to, uh, to create a social uh, initiative, to stay together, uh, to make a social cohesion uh, between different parts of the, of the society. Um, the last project we did uh, is uh, very known in, uh, in Italy. Uh, because starting from two years ago, uh, from a period when uh, we knew that uh, uh, many migrants were starting to, were trying to arrive in Sicily, uh, escaping from the Libyan prison, uh, uh, we knew a lot of people that were in that part of the, of the world that were trying to, to arrive and that they didn't arrive for, for, the, <laughs> for, for the sea. Uh, we decided to contribute and to uh, take part in an action, in a national election uh, that uh, bought uh, uh, a boat. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, we bought Med uh, Mediterranean, that is a, is a boat that uh, makes search and rescue in the Mediterranean Sea. And that uh, um, uh, is from uh, two years, in the, in, is, that is working from two years. And that is always in the, the, the discussion because saving people in this moment uh, in the sea is something very uh, not uh, uh, well seen, if I can say it like that. Uh, so uh, we are in the middle of the political discussion of what uh, people need and what are the uh, needs and the, um, the human rights not respected of the people in, in this moment in the other part of the of the world. Uh, I, I will close um, um, saying that we start from the idea, we start from uh, um, a strong point that are human rights. 
that are the same for everyone. And starting from the respect of that, we can discuss of what we want and, and, and organize all the practice we want. We, we always say that in Sicily, uh, we have uh, 20,000 almost people um, arriving from the south of the world. And in the political discussion, we always say uh, here about people that come to steal something, steal the job, steal the opportunity and so on. But in the, in the same time, almost 20,000 people native uh, go uh, away from Sicily in the world to look for good opportunity. So we cannot understand which is the difference to go for a new opportunity or to come to uh, steal something. So we start from the idea that human beings are the same and the human rights have to be the same for, for everyone. So starting from this point, we try to create our project and our model. So thanks. And uh, if, I, if you have any uh, question later, I will be here. This is our sentence that is uh, that means my land is where I put my feet. That means as a, easily you can understand that you can feel at home whatever you want. In my idea. Eh? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, welcome to the second session of this uh, webinar today. Uh, we ended up with uh, Claudio from Multivolti Italy and uh, Tui from New Zealand. And now we will continue with Kelly Pollard from uh, Australia. Uh, Kelly is Virat Jury Indigenous Researcher and Lecturer in Charles Darwin University. And um, she has a Bachelor of Arts in, uh, from Charles Darwin University and Australian National uh, University. Uh, and a PhD, Flinders University, majoring in contact archeology. span And uh, she is a researcher uh, with specialization on indigenous uh, epistemologies, ontologies, and axiologies, means indigenous way of knowing, being, and doing. Uh, she deals with indigenous research methods and research ethics, uh, Australian uh, colonization history and reconcil reconciliation treaty, and truth telling about Australian history. And she currently retains an Australian Research Council prestigious research award to uh, investigate the contact history uh, between TV Aboriginal people and Europeans in the Northern Territory of Australia. Uh, thank you, Kelly, uh, for joining us today. And the screen is yours now. So thank you very much for the introduction, Merv, I appreciate that. And, and I would like to extend a thanks to the hosts of this webinar series. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I will just begin by sharing my screen. Okay. So um, to begin with, I would like to say that, uh, you know, um, I am, giving this presentation uh, as an Indigenous person who's using a, uh, a critical lens on the status of the protection of Indigenous heritage in Australia. And I'm saying that um, I, it's time. Uh, we need to have a say in protecting our Indigenous heritage in Australia. Um, and I will work through um, the situation as, as it is in Australia for us Indigenous people. Um, I, I'm taking a broad um, uh, sweep to the to the situation in Australia. So if you have anything really quite specific, um, a question that you'd like to ask me about a specific issue, please do. But I'm just going to give you sort of a broad general um, sort of perspective. Um, in Australia, when we give public uh, talks, it's the custom now to make a declaration of recognizing uh, local Indigenous people. So I'm in Darwin, which is in the Northern Territory of Australia, the remote, um, the most uh, remote northernmost city in Australia. And uh, I'm on, on Larrakia land, uh, is the traditional owner of the Darwin region. And so it's customary for me to acknowledge um, and pay respects and uh, to the Larrakia 
elders past, present and future on whose land I'm giving this presentation to this webinar today. And I would also like to extend my um, respects to Twi and any other Indigenous people who are um, as, you know, participating in this webinar today. So I'm approaching this subject from the point of view of Indigenous heritage and the lack of empowerment of Aboriginal people in Australia to have a meaningful role in protecting inheritance. Okay, this lack of empowerment reflects the lack of political will to enact self-determination of, Ab of Aboriginal people in the heritage arena. In particular, in having a say in the legal protection and policy development of ancestor heritage. Using a critical Indigenous lens, current heritage laws in Australia perpetuate colonialism, which is the mechanism for the marginalization, the domination, the discrimination and the exclusion of Aboriginal people from heritage protection. The erasure manifests as the deliberate destruction of Aboriginal heritage across Australia every day in every state and territory. Just to give you a, a, a brief history, a background history, a lot of laws protecting in Australia, um, protecting heritage in Australia were originally drafted in the 1970s. And so they're quite old now. And a lot of them have not, um, you know, altered uh, to significant um, effect to reflect momentous changes that have occurred in Australian society over time. So um, the problem for Aboriginal people in Australia is that a lot of state and territory heritage laws are old, they're outdated, they're even archaic in some senses. And this is problematic for Aboriginal people who um, have been fighting relentlessly, non-stop actually, since, since, since legislation of the heritage came into being in Australia, to have a really more um, meaningful role, an empowered role in heritage, because we're dealing with really old laws. Archaeologists originally had a major influence in the principles encoded in heritage legislation in Australia, which is one of the reasons why the scientific aspect of significance for protection is prevalent and prominent in heritage laws in Australia. Back in the 1970s, governments in state and territories sought the advice and the input of archaeologists about what to include in heritage laws. And of course, um, this was a, um, a good opportunity for uh, archeologists who were overwhelmingly, if not all, um, non-Indigenous white archeologists, because I should just say as an aside that, um, you know, in nearly 60 years of um, the discipline of archeology span being in Australia, the discipline has only produced a very small cohort of people who, um, who identify as Indigenous with a PhD in archeology span in Australia, Pretty sure back in 1970, there weren't any indigenous people who had a PhD in archeology. span So, but coming back to the point that I'm making here, um, non-indigenous archeologists were given the opportunity to have a say in what should go into heritage laws in Australia. And they prioritized making um, the scientific significance of archeological resources the priority. Okay, and they did this because they were seeking to protect their future um, research interests in the archaeological resources. Okay, now, but Aboriginal people were not even consulted about heritage law in the past. So the values that are important to Aboriginal people then and now are not reflected in some heritage laws used in the present. Kelly, sorry, can I just slide? Would you be able to put your um, screen on? Uh, presentation mode. It will make oh, yes, it easier sorry. for the audience. So sorry. Okay. Is that better? Yes, thank you. So fast forward to the present. Uh, when an incident like what happened in Australia in late 2020 in remote Western Australia occurs, it is hard for Aboriginal people to get a sense or real justice for the trauma they sustain as a result. Now, I, I understand that this is an uh, internationally diverse audience of participants in this webinar. I'm not sure how many of you would be familiar with what happened in late 2020 in Australia, in remote Western Australia. The multinational mining company Rio Tinto, uh, operating in a remote area of the Western Australian state, uh, 
deliberately planted and detonated explosives to destroy a large rock shelter in Dukan Gorge um, to access high grade minerals for profit. Now I should point out that Rio Tinto has had a long-term presence in this part of Australia and it has had a long-term uh, interaction and relationship with the traditional Aboriginal owners in this part of Australia. Um, and it had been involved in um, you know, other operations on the traditional country of the traditional Aboriginal owners of this region that did involve the destruction of Aboriginal heritage sites and that the traditional Aboriginal owners knew about this and were aware of it. In this particular instance, this was a, um, I'll just show you. So we're talking about, if you look on the map of Australia, if you look at the light green state on the far left, that is the state of Western Australia. And if you look in the box next to the map of Australia, the region that we're talking about in that state of Australia is called the Pilbara region. And it's a remote area of Australia. Uh, so um, Rio Tinto made the decision to blow up this very large rock shelter just give you another, here it is. This is a, a local photo. Um, on the left is what the rock shelter looked like before the blast. And on the right is what the rock shelter looked like after clearing and after the blast. It was virtually, and there are other photos, but the rock shelter was virtually destroyed. And, you know, this caused so much pain and trauma to the traditional Aboriginal people of the Pilbara region who own this country but it also caused a lot of trauma to Aboriginal people right across Australia because of the reality that we are dealing with, um, you know, witnessing uh, the destruction of our heritage on a daily basis um, as, a, as a result of, you know, either mining operations or development. So it was a very traumatic experience for everybody. It even um, left an indelible impact on a majority of non-Indigenous Australians who were shocked at um, what Rio Tinto had done and, uh, you know, Rio Tinto's um, investor shareholders uh, in the UK um, took some uh, actions in their shareholder meetings with the, the board of Rio Tinto to express their um, dismay at what Rio Tinto had done. Now, before the blast, the rock shelter had been dated by another archaeologist to about um, to be about 46,000 years old. And so this, you know, this is one of Australia's oldest um, archaeological sites. And um, it's it was a place that was of sacred significance to the local Aboriginal people. And it was especially um, disturbing and traumatic to Aboriginal people because you know, there were thousands of um, uh, artifacts that had been collected and removed from the site before the blast by the archaeologist and his team. But one of the finds that, that they um, discovered was a length of long plaited hair. And when they DNA tested that length of hair, it um, showed a direct link from 4,000 years ago to the traditional Aboriginal people today who still live on that country and who own that country. So the, the rock shelter contained the remains of a hair belt that was um, made by a, a direct ancestor of the traditional owners who live on that country today. So this was another reason for their trauma. Although that hair, I should say that hair belt was, was um, you know, it was rescued during the excavations, but it, the, the site context for it was destroyed. Okay, so fast forward to the present. Um, so the incident in Australia caused um, the federal parliament to have a uh, inquiry. Um, and so that was late last year, our federal parliament initiated a Senate inquiry into the actions of Rio Tinto and it sought submissions from Rio Tinto, other mining companies in Australia, other developer interests in Australia, ordinary citizens and Aboriginal people. Um, and so the traditional owners of the area um, that the blast took uh, place on also submitted their, um, 
their application to the committee to um, make it clear what their what the impact of the blast was on them and to make it clear that uh, you know trauma um, you know the destruction of heritage actually causes Aboriginal people real trauma psychological trauma emotional trauma spiritual trauma um, so the uh, inquiry was uh, it's it, in that sense it's been a good venue for Aboriginal people to be able to express you know what kind of impacts um, this kind of destruction has on people's lives and their identity as well um, so that uh, inquiry is continuing and the Parliament is due to release its report with recommendations later this year. Um, and those of us who are watching that space are hoping that the Senate inquiry will come up with recommendations about, um, you know, how to involve Aboriginal people, like so repealing and amending the, the WA heritage legislation, but also how to involve Aboriginal people in, you know, in those reforms, in those legislative reforms. Um, so as a result of this, uh, this incident, the relationship between Rio Tinto and the traditional owners for that region of Western Australia has broken down. I would say it's broken down completely based on what I've um, read in um, the media from the traditional owners. Um, and this is of course, you know, from the media's, from the company's point of view, it's a PR disaster, but, um, you know, um, from the from the from our society's point of view, um, Rio Tinto has severely um, compromised its social license to operate. We call that, you know, a social license to operate. When they uh, when companies um, do um, such massively destructive acts like this, then it causes all Australian citizens to question the right of companies to. Um, to operate with the endorsement of the of the broader community, and you know the, the whole incident has revealed the policy bias um, of the West Australian government in favour of proponents um, to uh, you know um, to do these to have these operations on country. Uh, Western Australia is one of Australia's. Um, uh, uh, the state, the economy of the state is based on um, mineral exploration. So, um, you know, mining companies uh, in, in Western Australia have a lot of power, um, although a lot of the profits, if not most of the profits, go offshore uh, and not into the, um, not into, not as much into the local Aboriginal community as has been previously thought and the profits don't go into as much into the broader Australian society as previously thought. Um, nevertheless, there is a, a government policy bias in favour of proponents in Western Australia. Uh, and, you know, there's also a, 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 um, an anti-bias, if you like, towards Aboriginal um, interests and representation in discussions about um, law reform in Western Australia. So, but the, you know, the, the whole incident, this, this blast of this very old ancient sacred rock shelter um, really, really made Australians, the rest of Australia. In Australia, we talk about mainstream Australia and we talk about indigenous Australia, okay? Um, and mainstream Australians really sat up and took notice of what was happening to Aboriginal heritage in Australia as a result of what Rio Tinto did to Chukum Gorge. And it coincided with, you know, the era that we're living through at the moment, where there's an emphasis on Black Lives Matter. Um, and this movement is, you know, uh, very much a part of Indigenous Australia in Australia. Um, um, but the thing is that the, the incident, um, you know, it made Australians sit up and take notice where before that they weren't too tuned in to what was happening with Aboriginal heritage in Australia. So their interest is to be welcomed because Australia is at a critical point in time. Last year, we observed the um, 250 year anniversary of the European invasion of our continent and the dispossession of my ancestors and other Aboriginal people and myself. Um, so, you know, last year was a, a critical um, moment of a, a critical year for reflecting on, you know, truth-telling about colonisation history in Australia. Um, 
uh, it was a critical moment for reflecting on, you know, the treaty making process in Australia um, and other political, um, pertinent political issues that are facing Indigenous Australians. So um, I've included here a link called Uluru Statement from the Heart, which was released to critical acclaim in Australia. And you can have a look at that. The Uluru Statement um, is um, the result of a long period of time where some of our Aboriginal leaders and um, working with non-Indigenous Australians toured the country to interview, discuss, talk with Aboriginal Australians about what um, should be the way forward in, in our, in our um, future and came up with this really beautiful um, piece of work that's called Uluru Statement from the Heart. And in it, 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 you know, it addresses a little bit of the, of the colonization history, but it calls for some critically important political changes to um, Aboriginal rights in Australia. And I think you should have a look at that. It might interest you. Um, it just gives you a bit of a snapshot on um, where um, the, the political debate for Aboriginal rights in Australia is at at the moment. Um, will anything change? This is the question. I mean, around Australia, um, like I said at the introduction, uh, each state and territory have their own heritage laws. Uh, most of them are old. Most of them uh, have not, um, you know, their, their, their principles encoded in them have not moved with the cha and changed with the times over the decades, which make them sort of clanky and difficult to deal with for Aboriginal communities. Um, the Chook and Gorge incident did spark um, broader conversations in Australia about heritage legislation, how old it is, how much it needs to change. Um, this discussion is happening in Western Australia at the moment, um, but the discussions need to hear the interests and rights of Indigenous people and what they want to have in the heritage laws that reflects what they decide is important to protect. So what I'm saying here is that um, in terms of, you know, it's time we need to have a say, Aboriginal people need to be able to have their voice um, front and centre in the discussions. Um, governments should be listening and actually hearing what they are saying. Um, and Aboriginal people should be empowered to decide what they want heritage laws to protect. And at least they should have a, a say in that. But this is politically contentious in Australia because the mining and development corporations have immense influence with politicians. Um, comparatively, Aboriginal people have less impact with politicians, but Aboriginal people are having more impact um, among Australian citizens. Um, you know, getting better at gaining the support um, of Australians and, and influencing their opinions, um, which is a very important um, support to harness because it's an important factor to achieving so, um, changes that we're aiming for, such as um, pressuring, you know, keeping the pressure on mining companies and developers um, to remember that, you know, the, so the social license to operate is not a privilege. It is something that they should earn and they should earn it by um, making sure that they work in ethical ways with Aboriginal communities to protect heritage. So currently Indigenous Australia is experiencing the highest levels of popular support for Indigenous rights for the first time in 250 years. Uh, this is obviously a pivotal moment for our reconciliation movement and social justice movements. Um, the uh, some recent research that came out of the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the Australian National University in Canberra um, was interesting. When I had a look at their uh, one of their monographs, I, I, I saw that they were arguing that if a referendum had been held in 2017, Australians would have voted for key political changes to enhance Indigenous rights. And the, the importance of this development can't be understated because Referendums in Australia are uh, like rare as hen's teeth and uh, politicians don't like to um, hold referendums. And if, if a referendum is um, seriously on the table for thought in Australia, um, then there are a lot of naysayers who come out of, the, uh, out of the woodwork to say that, you know what, referendums are usually unpopular with Australians and they usually fail. So for um, this independent research body to 
find through its research that a majority of Australians uh, would have voted for to enhance political rights of Indigenous Australians if a referendum had been held is really quite important. Recent polling by the Council for Reconciliation finds that a majority of Australians support the calls made in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is to have and to recognise an Aboriginal voice to Parliament and to recognise um, in the Constitution Aboriginal people and to have a formal truth-telling process in Australia about Australia's colonisation history and ongoing colonialism in Indigenous Australia, but to also have conversations about treaty making in Australia. I should just point out that with the treaty making process in Australia, um, at the federal level, um, we have not had uh, political support for a national treaty with Aboriginal people with the Australian nation state. Um, and so some individual states and territories are going down the path of treaty making discussions with their Aboriginal constituents in their individual states and territories. So why doesn't all that unprecedented support result in heritage laws that empower Indigenous rights? Well, I pointed out that political will seems to be stalling, um, fundamentally changing the rights and status of Indigenous people in Australia. Um, you know, it's doubtful that powerful, entrenched and influential commercial interests, aided by sections of the media in Australia, would endorse changes in the rights and status of Indigenous people if those changes were a threat to their interests. Um, and we have a long history of policy deficit thinking and discourse in Australia. 250 years of governments, colonial authorities perceiving Indigenous people in Australia through a deficit lens. This means that, um, you know, the deficit lens uh, of uh, perception and policy making in Australia um, uh, is, you know, informed by racism and discrimination. Um, Aboriginal people are already the most marginalised people in Australia. We are all minorities in our own continent. Um, domination of the major, um, predominantly uh, Anglo-British uh, uh, ancestry population is dominant. Um, but the I can say that the deficit policy lens and its associated discourses are being challenged by Indigenous academics in Australia. In the policy environment, the issue of Indigenous people's involvement is absolutely crucial because we know that there's not enough of it happening. The policy environment is dominated by the dominant culture uh, and Aboriginal people, um, you know, Involvement in policy can be at the senior levels through the public service um, that advise the government. Um, you know, there is a, a national Aboriginal kind of advisory group to the government that does give some advice on policy issues to, to the government. But, um, you know, it's debatable whether that, that, that group um, are fully representative of all of Indigenous Australia when it comes to a say in policy issues that affect people, our, our lives. Um, we used to have a national body that was our representative voice. Um, and that's been replaced by this smaller group uh, of hand-picked Indigenous um, advisors to the government. Um, but currently in Australia, there's a national debate going on about the absence of a nationally representative Indigenous voice to Parliament and therefore to the policies that affect Indigenous people. We do have a few Indigenous ministers at the federal level in our Parliament and they play an advisory role as well to the government. But until, um, you know, without effective policy representation, Indigenous interests in Australia, um, you know, the ability to be, to have a meaningful say in our own affairs and in, in, in the policies that affect our lives remains predominantly determined by non-Indigenous governments. The Jukun Gorge issue brought home to all Australians a sense of powerlessness Aboriginal people feel about exclusion from policy and legislation discussions. Um, really, one of the things that Aboriginal people were saying they wanted as a result of what happened at Jukun Gorge um, with Rio Tinto is um, the kind of reform to heritage laws that would give Aboriginal people the right to veto government decisions to approve 
um, commercial operations. And of course, this is a very politically um, contentious issue as well. Governments are likely to resist, you know, Aboriginal rights to veto co um, commercial operations on their country. But it's still part of the discussion. Uh, sorry, um, can we can we uh, pop up a little bit so uh, to be finished on time? Pardon? Uh, can you pop up in a minute? I mean, we are a bit uh, exceeding the time. Yes, I think I'm on my last. I am. Okay. Great. So the latest big scale disruption of a place of sacred significance to the traditional owners. Um, is proof that it's time that Indigenous people had a meaningful say in discussions about heritage protection laws and policies. And what this looks like in practice is Aboriginal people being at the table of discussions, having a leading role in discussions, being empowered to influence decision making and having their views encoded in laws and policies. And finally, government inaction to implement popular support for significant changes in Australia has seen public and private institutions show leadership instead and give that recognition and endorsement. Okay, um, finally, if the spirit and principles of the Uluru Statement from the Heart was recognised, it could inform the basis of Indigenous policies and laws that affect the lives and heritage of Indigenous people and potentially reverse the 250 years of marginalisation, exclusion and erasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. It was really interesting and sincere uh, intervention for today's webinar. Thank you. And now we are passing to Dijle Beshtash from uh, Loading Art Collective. And uh, Loading is a non-profit art space, aims to enrich contemporary arts dialogue in Diyarbakir from uh, 2017. Uh, their funding call was not to bring together the artists uh, living and working in Diyarbakir under one roof, uh, but rather resolve the issues they have been encountering in production and project related issues. Uh, they also uh, try to strengthen strength the international artistic awareness and interaction uh, in the Arbaker art scene through various uh, cultural activities. Uh, today, on behalf of Loading Karsipe, Dijle Beshtaş uh, will speak. Uh, she is also a practicing architect and working in the Arbaker World City. And Dijle, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Screen is yours now. Marva teşekkür ederim giriş için. First of all, I'd like to say hello to everyone. I'd like to start my speech in this way because we have a limited time. This, my city is one of the oldest settlements in the world and in 2015 it was proclaimed as a part of the World Heritage List, the Inn Wall or the Castle City. I will be looking at the tangible and the intangible cultural heritage, how it was demolished, what kind of destruction had been imposed upon this, which followed by a migration, which is also based on the socio-cultural division of the society in general. In this term, the Urban Solidarity, UNESCO and other actors have developed some attitudes and then loading, as loading, we had developed a perspective against this. Why I am trying to explain this? Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry because it's important. Uh, Dijle, are you sharing your screen? Do you want to share your screen for the presentation or? Oh, okay, okay, waiting. Dijle will be sharing her presentation soon, but not at the moment. Why loading is attaching such a importance to specialization? And how we are developing an attitude against the this location and why speciality is very important. Of course, I have to tell a 10 years of process because this is a result of a 10 year process. Now, let me share my presentation if you allow me.
rather than what activities we are carrying out in loading, I'd like to emphasize the speciality of loading, how we have been special in uh, what an environment. First, I think we have to go into details of the urban history. Many religions, beliefs and cultures are coming together in a kind of melting pot in Diyarbakir. This historical city has tangible and intangible heritage in itself from Hittites, uh, Assyrians, Persians, Romans, Ottomans, and we can see the traces of many civilizations. We can see its archaeology and its cultural anthropology, and we can see that this had been carried up to now. This is a very old map of Sur or the walled city. It is documenting the life in walled city. Since it's a castle city, yes, it is surrounded by walls, but it has also a walled part, the inner castle. And in the inner castle, we have many Roman and Byzantine archaeological ruins. We have found this as a result of archaeological excavations. We have around a 5,000 year old of Amida Mount. Amida is the old name of Diyarbakir, not of interpreter. Actually, its structure is more akin to a medieval city. To speak about its urban tissue, it has blind alleys and very narrow ones, and uh, its sun and shadow ratio had been adjusted very well, and it has fountains in the corners. This is the structure of the city. Of course, its context is very important because it's a hot environment, it's a hot climate, what we are experiencing in the Arbaker. So it has uh, buildings with yards which key allows a spatial climatization and it creates an organic tissue or organic texture of streets and alleys. I will be explaining them in the upcoming presentation. You see a view from the inner castle and this is the organic alley structure of Sur. They are quite narrow. It allows us to experience the city as a pedestrian. And this is the old typology of a Diyarbakir house. Actually, Diyarbakir's house could protect its traditional structure up to 1940s. But after 1950s, a lot of migration happened and the city began to widen towards the periphery of the walls. And because of this, some urban transformation project, uh, projects had been started. One of them is dated 2011, the Arbaker Historical Sur Protection Project. In this way, the city was divided into those who are entitled and those who are not entitled, which means that they, uh, they are having a title deed or not. Those Entitled, those having deeds had been transferred to the mass housing units, which is supported by the government, which is completely different from uh, the context and texture in the inner castle. Those who are not entitled are just displaced and they haven't been suggested any other facility. This created a very serious level of reaction in the people living here because the people living in the mass housing units cannot, they are indebted and they cannot sustain their livings because while people were moved to here, they had to be indebted. And those who are entitled has developed a reaction because they were displaced. They developed a resistance against evacuation of the houses, eviction of the houses actually. And in 2019, this urban transformation had been stopped and uh, 2009, sorry, 
then the Ministry of Environment and Urban Affairs had proclaimed Hafsal Gardens, which is a part of the World Heritage, as a disaster area. And it was called a reserve area, which means that uh, they would be able to do whatever they want in this area. And it means that it's possible to open these regions for settlements and for zoning plans. You see an air photo of inner wall, Hafsal Gardens. It is one of the oldest settlements in the world. And this is the castle city or walled city. Diyarbakir is under the load of the regional problems and it had gone, uh, gone through many morphological transformations, which is hard to predict. In this part of my speech, I'd like to speak about the melting pot, which is bringing together different cultures and beliefs and which is based on a common memory. The power had transformed this with its uh, construction policies, why it wasn't protected, why it was sacrificed to the conflicts processes. That's what I want to tell. In order to tell this process, I think I have to refer to so-called solution process. I'm quoting from Wikipedia. The solution process also known as peace process or the Kurdish Turkish peace process was a peace process started by Justice and Development Party government, which aimed to resolve the Turkey PKK conflict. The conflict has been ongoing since 1984 but, and throughout the solution process, there weren't conflicts and there was an atmosphere of peace in the city. This is what is told. But after 2015, this started in 2015, 13, but it was ended in 2015. After it was ended, the Erbaker governorship had proclaimed curfew and it lasted very long. It was um, said to be the longest curfews in the world. Of course, the cultural heritage was impacted very strongly, especially the monumentary structures within the walled city, because they just were demolished. This destruction actually reminded the urban transformation project, which had been stopped before. And these conflicts had been a ground for reviving that uh, urban transformation process. Because there is a real destruction, it is really hard to reconstruct it. There are some interruptions in the sound of the speaker. We cannot hear at the moment. Yes, planning uh, had been and zoning had been used as a method to transform the region. I don't want to take more time and to wrap up. Since it's uh, an urban protection area, there was a so-called reconstruction plan for protect. Of course, there were changes in this reconstruction plan for protect. The urban equipment, social equipment, recreation areas, educational areas, housing areas were demolished completely in many places and they were replaced with white streets which was uh, focused on securitization and defense policy. These uh, roads are open to the police and in order to do this they had to demolish registered or unregistered licensed or unlicensed buildings because it is hard for police vehicles enter these um, narrow alleys and you see the conflict process after 2015 you see many buildings had been demolished the previous according to the previous image it wasn't like this you know you'd remember this is an air photo from 2017 which shows 
how intensive is uh, the destruction? Of course, in this urban regeneration plan, the protection is seen only on the facade. Just change had been made on the facade level because in the original, actually in the original structure of Sur, there weren't many blind and deaf facades, but in the new version, we have many blind and deaf facades. They just wanted to demolish the existing culture and reconstruct the culture as desired by the power or government. The results of the urban regeneration had been worked in this way, the architectural heritage had been eliminated and this led to a socio-cultural division within the society. How this happened? In the sur, there used to be narrow alleys and a very tight neighborhood relation. But people had been migrated, forced to migrate to these apartment blocks which are in the periphery of the city rather than the center of the city as Sur was, Sur neighborhood was. And we can see how it decreased the urban diversity. What kind of effects can be seen as a result of this? This was called the project of urban revival, but actually it just transformed the city center into a trade and finance center without any settlement or housing. People were just carried to the periphery of the urban area. So it was a complete urban transformation. UNESCO also emphasized actually how this area was eliminated or abolished in total. And one of the reasons to do this was to end the opposition coming from the cities and the streets in general. And all the transformation was based on securitization. After, just as if it was after uh, Paris Commune, the Paris with white boulevards. The, one of the main reasons for this is actually to abolish the social solidarity and special joint act of the neighborhood people and in general to eliminate the political organization. In Sur, people were knowing one another and they could uh, do shopping as they liked, but in an apartment block life, it's not like this. They are just being worried about how to pay their debts, how can they survive? And their everything was just indexed to economical survival, economic survival. And of course, urban opposition um, went down because the needs changed, people's needs changed. Of course, this uh, regeneration or transformation is experienced in everywhere in Turkey, but we know that it has uh, different practical results compared to the Western Turkey, because the urban transformation in Sur was completely based on securitization uh, strategy in terms of uh, sec giving uh, security forces the priority. There is a migration at play here. I'd like to focus on it too. This Security problem is, of course, going back to the old times, and we always know that violence has a spatial correspondent beginning from the Ottoman era. Always, security was uh, one of the most important points of Kurdish issue, and its ethnopolitical dimension was uh, tried to be rendered unseen. the exiles, deportation and settlement were most important policies of the violence imposed uh, on the region. 
actually in many places we are seeing examples of this because the cities are just demolished and they are recreated based on the government's approach so they are trying to create the city of the power the people who had been forced to migration from sur actually had been had come to sur because in 1990s their villages were evicted because of the same security policies so it is a dual migration first they had been forced to migrate to uh, diyarbakir city center from their villages now from diyarbakir city center to the peripheries of the diyarbakir again it's related to security policies securitization and migration and uh, it is decided by others rather than the subjects of the process of course they are trying to eliminate the use of kurdish language people when they are in uh, the apartment blocks they are not in the political spheres and the use of kurdish language is just uh, limited to households so it's not used in public sphere anymore So far, I tried to cover the process in general. But while this process was developing, of course, the Chamber of Architects, uh, different NGOs, different associations had prepared reports for UNESCO and similar actors. But the results of the reports were not quite positive. Actually, they weren't finalized or we couldn't get any result, any consequence of these attempts. UNESCO apparently just says that they want to protect the walls, the city walls. Cannot hear the speaker because of internet problem. Yes, the inner wall wasn't protected in this process. What happened in this process? we cannot hear the speaker because of connection problem loading began its activities in order to seek a kind of healing to create a space for people the people are displaced our culture was uh, being tried to be erased so we emphasized the importance of being a space and we began to work as a space. Yes, we are discussing issues such as decolonization and colonization, but actually one of the most important issues to revive here is why speciality or specialization, specialization is so important. Um, so far, that's all from me. Maybe I can elaborate on when we are in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Dijle, for your contribution. Teşekkürler, Dijle. Um, thank you to all of you uh, for these very interesting uh, presentations and contributions for today. Uh, the very aim of these webinars actually is also to facilitate and to make the dialogue environment uh, among civil society, among uh, community groups, among all of us. So now uh, we are invite you uh, to provide your questions and your comments uh, to us through the question and answer uh, block at the end. And now we have already some uh, questions here and I'll just, uh, okay, uh, Tui, the first one uh, is going to Tui. Uh, really happy to have seen the presentation and what New Zealand seems to be doing for its uh, communities. It seems to be like indigenous movements are the only ones who legitimately acknowledge a spiritual dimension and need for spiritual rights. 
uh, it seems like colonization and modernity formalized and imposed religion, which was also instrumental in creating much mar marginalization. How do you negotiate such compete competing religious and spiritual traditions in your work and in movements towards reclamation. Tui, uh, you have already answered the question in written, but we would like to have your answer uh, verbally uh, to record. Thank you, Tui. Are you here? <clears throat> Tui is typing in the chat that she is having some internet problems. So I'm not sure she can... Um... She can at the moment and uh, hear us. Okay, we can just, uh, I can speak for <laughs> Tui, uh, what she was written in the uh, question and answer part. Uh, thanks Deepak for your questions. The colonial systems which exclude respect for the spiritual dimensions of water, earth and understanding of our, uh, Aura or Maori uh, the richness of our spiritual connections are why we reclaim and practice our, our ceremonies, share the seed and cultivate seed freedom and food sovereignty uh, to release our dependence on government programs, which largely promote industrial agriculture. Uh, we see the expressions in India of small farmers and we have Aroa for the people there. So this was to his answer. And... Uh, Deepak has another question to all the panelists uh, asking heritage is a contentious term especially when it gets defined and recognized formalized by institutions like state and world bodies since often leads to marginalization of something else that isn't recognized yet the marginalized need to visualize themselves uh, to challenge existing hegemony uh, also, when we speak of sites of heritage, we need to shift it to a more people-centric approach, acknowledging practices, languages, knowledge system, knowledge system uh, and material culture. How do you see your work striking this balance? Uh, Marco already answered the question. Marco, uh, you want to make your intervention also verbal here? Uh, no, no, it was just uh, I mean, uh, a way to continue the chat. But for me, it's right what uh, he say. As I said, I, I'm aligned with uh, what he's saying. Uh, I mean, the tendency also in the, I mean, in the recent years is to enlarge this, um, uh, li this life, a uh, co coexistence with other living beings. So not only human beings, but also nature and um, animals, for example. And this is very, very much uh, evident in the new trends of circular economy and the deb all the debates in climate change and so on. So I believe that if you see that from the landscape perspective that we are uh, in our context, we should take this context as a reference. I mean, not, not do uh, like a perspective view from humans or from uh, industries and so on. And this is very much connected to our way maybe to uh, re uh, revise our economic um, perspectives, but this was a uh, yeah just a small comment maybe to the question. Okay, Tui also has another uh, reply to uh, Deepak's questions. Uh, she's saying we also carry out cultural impact assessments and have established cultural monitoring frameworks which help to assess policy impacts uh, related to heritage, and these include our gods and goddesses traditional lunar calendars, languages, and the richness of our biocultural heritage, uh, she said. Uh, okay, uh, if one of the panelists uh, want to contribute to this comment or questions, if not, I'll pass to another question to Claudia. Uh, Sergio Tassi is asking uh, to Claudia from Multivolti about the situation in the Mediterranean Sea. I have the impression that slavery has not been abolished, only transformed. Uh, the current strategy is to destabilize the governments of the countries whose population they want to turn into slaves uh, to artificially generate a migra migratory flow that allows not only to have in Europe workers in conditions of semi or complete slavery, 
but also to be able to eventually say, but look, if you don't like it, why did you come? The slave ships of the 18th and 19th centuries have been transformed into the boats of 20th and 21st. And the most atrocious joke is that the former were paid for the for by the slavers, while the latter are paid for the uh, migrant slaves. Uh, what do you think about this interpretation? No, uh, days and weeks to, to discuss, uh, taking also, exchanging also. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Claudia. Ah, no, someone wrote no microphone. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe it was not just not for me. <laughs> um, I was saying uh, again, cannot hear. Oh, I can hear you. I think they have to, in the interpretation button, uh, mm. they have to turn off uh, because they're still in the translation uh, section, in the interpretation section. So they have to go down on the globe and then click on that and put off. Yeah, maybe they have set uh, mute original audio. Mm. Okay, so I... Close the interpretation. So you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I, I was saying uh, 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 that that is a very complex question and uh, if you if you are interested we can con we can continue the discussion even in the next days uh, um, even if you want uh, exchange our contacts uh, I, I, I'm very interested in into the discussion because I don't think there is the, the, the truth, but uh, we need uh, to find, uh, I mean, um, the point of the discussion. Um, in my opinion, uh, I, I think we have uh, two uh, points of view uh, to start on this discussion. The first is, wh is what uh, we see on the, mm, on the media, what we read on the newspaper. Um, the, the other side is uh, that uh, is asked to the people that come in this period from uh, the south of the world, their stories. And I like read newspaper. I like uh, sometimes uh, see the, the uh, TV, uh, but I, I prefer um, speak with people and ask them uh, what, what uh, which is their um, experience in terms of migration system and uh, uh, and everything around. Uh, in this period, in, in, in this uh, uh, moment, the, uh, there are no legal way to arrive in Italy from Libya, from the south, from from Africa, uh, for example. So. Um, the only way for a person that comes from a poor uh, or disadvantaged area uh, is to uh, look for uh, a, a very dangerous uh, route to, to come. So when you start that, uh, that, uh, that route, you became in the same moment invisible. And when you are invisible, you, are, you, are easily, you became easily a slave. So the problem uh, on the, on the uh, basis is a legal problem uh, because I'm a slave if there is not a law that uh, uh, protect me from that condition. Um, in this moment, what, what we are doing in Europe is, uh, legal, is trying to legalize this slavery because of many, many reasons. Uh, Europe is a... Uh, group of states where there are also different approach to this, uh, to this uh, uh, topic, to this topic. Uh, so it's not easy to speak about uh, something common, but in Europe for sure, in this moment, there is a legalization of uh, relation with the Libyan, for example, authorities uh, that 
from one side is not considered a, 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 I would say a, like a good state, uh, a good government. Uh, on the other side is paid. I was reading this morning that Europe in the la just in the last year paid 700, uh, 700,000 millions to the Libyan coast to uh, govern the coast and, and to um, uh, not allow to the people to live from uh, Africa. So we are saying in Europe is the, uh, the place uh, where human rights were born. Now we are asking to some another to protect us uh, no? and to make the crimes that we are not able, uh, that we don't want to do. So we are paying to, the, uh, to other people. And in the same time, there is a common uh, um, idea uh, in the biggest part of European people, I, I have to say, because I think they are the majority, uh, that when they have to choose if stay stand on the side of the exploiters or of the exploited, they stay with exploiters. So the problem in the countryside is not of the owner that pay few money to the uh, to the migrant to the uh, employer, but it's the problem of the employer that is unpaid and that. Uh, I, um, I mean, is is uh, is working to grow up uh, uh, an illegal system. So the problem is the is is the one of the illegal person, and not of the person that is exploiting that illegal person. So the the majority, uh, the, the common idea is to um, to to put away the slavery and not to fight against the, the exploiters. And I think that starting from, from this, we should discuss a lot. We should work on the information system, but also on the sense of responsibility of our uh, society. And as I said before, it's a complex question. I'm very interested on that. And if you want, we can continue later in the next days. Thank you. Okay, I will just pass the Turkish question in, in the Turkish right. Just, just because um, Kelly has just, um, one of our speakers, so Kelly Pollard, Dr. Kelly Pollard has just said that she had to leave for another meeting. So she apologizes and she cannot uh, answer the questions live, but we will forward the question and hopefully she will have time. So yeah, Jacobo, we will try to forward the question and, and still ask it, the one you asked in the Q&A. And of course, we know we are running over time. So hopefully you can stay with us, but of course, if you cannot, then, um, we thank you for attending. Okay, uh, Çektar Taşkıran soruyor. Genelde yerel örgütlenme modeli olarak özelde Diyarbakır kentinde yaşanan uh, soylulaştırılması... ...and in particular in Diyarbakır. There are gentrification projects and what kind of steps should take local organizations in terms of these gentrification projects? The floor is yours. Thank you for the question. First, we know that gentrification is an approach from top to down. It is just imagination of the planning eye. Actually, we have to approach from the opposite direction. When there is a thought of gentrification, maybe the people living there, the neighborhood people should set up their own working Ground. For example, in Turkey, we have headman's office for each district, as each neighborhood, and these headman's offices or muktar offices can be organized in this way. People should be informed related to the urban transformation projects to be conducted on their locality what would be its results, what kind of sociological divisions will arise from this. I think in all these issues, the NGOs should be guiding in order to give information. I wonder what would be the answers of the other panelists. That's uh, also what I wonder. Okay, 
Okay, there is another question for Dijle. Um, so I want to paraphrase it. Dijle, uh, okay. If, if uh, loading has uh, done something, what happened uh, in Sur, in, Vault City, in the Arbaker Vault City, after uh, 2015 armed conflict, conflict uh, loading itself has a kind of intervention for what happened in uh, the Arbaker Vault City after uh, 2015. Marm ve ben soruyu burada göremiyorum. Benim için de açıklayabilir misin? Çeviri de benim için geç geliyor. Ee, şöyle diyor. UNESCO e, dünya mirası alın, alınmış e, surla ilgili e, yıkımlar. She's paraphrasing the question again. E, surdaki yıkımlardan sonra e, loading'in burada bir e, müdahalesi oldu mu? Herhangi bir şey yaptı mı? E, yıkımla alakalı direkt e, loading üzerinde yapılmış bir e, bir çalışma, bir aktivist bir duruş gibi bir şey oldu mu? Ee, We didn't have a direct intervention on the streets related to the demolishing of Sur, but we had conducted certain programs. For example, we have a residential program for the guest artists and researchers. With this program, we have invited many researchers from the world and Turkey, the critics, the arthritis. Actually, we are able to host them and we are able to give uh, them an, uh, a space to work. For example, Eray Çaylı conducted his PhD on Dich, uh, Tigris River, which is passing through Diyarbakır. Tigris means actually Dijla, not of interpreters, which is also the name of the speaker. And uh, he stayed in uh, loading for a few months in order to carry out his uh, PhD study. And while he was here, we wanted him to carry out some workshops to share his works with us. Also, now we have another program which is called uh, Bandicology of Photograph or Violence and Photograph Relation. So we are trying to document violence in uh, photograph and we are trying to compile the works and words spent on uh, this issue. Since one year, we are conducting this process. We have conducted uh, workshops with various researchers, of course, on an online platform. And we are approaching to an exhibition where our participants will exhibit uh, their results. In this project, we mostly supported the field research in, our, in the inner castle in the walled city, we try to provide participants some areas to continue their works. In this kind, we have some exchange programs and workshop programs in order that the city can be narrated by its own uh, subjects, the artists. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, thank you very much. I can pass the uh, floor again to lose for closing remarks, maybe. Well, I think we will keep it very short. I, I really would like to thank the speakers for their incredibly brave and uh, important work. Um, yeah, we. I mean, we've seen so many great examples of um, how you can organize and how you can uh, do things to really change uh, what is happening, as well as really challenge power and challenge um, the system, let's say, that, that is that is uh, oppressing many, many forms of, of uh, what we could call heritage. Um, and well, yeah, I think, I mean, it was a great, great webinar for me, at least it was super interesting. And we will continue the conversation with our next webinar, which will be on the 10th of March. 
Um, Kea, do, would you like to say something about it or shall I do it? Hi, yeah, happy to. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, on the 10th of March at 8 a.m. UTC, we've got um, the colonial legacies of gender and sexuality. We have uh, three speakers who will be speaking on sort of the legacies of normative um, gender and sexuality roles and norms and the ways that we see this in um, spaces around heritage and institutions and these sorts of dialogues um, and then ways and strategies we can um, deconstruct these as well so um, it's sure to be a really interesting discussion and debate we've got three great speakers um, and yes look forward to seeing some of you there as well Thank you all for joining and um, hope to see you next week. <laughs>